Hello everyone, Charles Watts here, the Arsenal correspondent at Gold, joining you on Wednesday morning. And it's a happy Wednesday morning, the sun is shining, Arsenal are back to winning ways in the back for now at the top of the Premier League. Uh, apologies, I always start with apologies, I know you always laugh about it in the comments, but apologies because I know I look alright, stay unshaven. Should have prepared better for this, but it's really early in the morning. <laughs> and I didn't get into 1am last night from the Emirates, barely slept. As always, after a night game. And uh, so, yeah, I look a bit of a mess. Probably sound a bit of a mess as well this morning. But who cares? Because Arsenal won. And they needed to win. And they got the job done yesterday. Albeit against the Chelsea side, who are an absolute shambles at the moment. I was talking to uh, Nizar Kinsella, who used to work at goal. He was our Chelsea correspondent goal. He works at Evening Standard yesterday. And I bumped into him just before the game yesterday at the, in the press box at the Emirates. And I was like, oh, I'm a bit worried about this. You know, Arsenal not playing well at the moment. The whole sort of narrative of... Chelsea being awful, they'll just probably. I just got a horrible feeling they're going to come here and and get a result. And he was like, Nah, nah, Chelsea are dreadful. And I was like, Oh, I'm not sure. And then within about 25 minutes, I looked at him. I was like, Yeah, yeah, you're right. <laughs> they were so so bad. But that's not to take anything away from Arsenal. They put the th put their foot on Chelsea's throat last night and didn't step off it until sort of about 60, 65 minutes eased off a little bit. And um, it was a tiny bit nerve in the end after Chelsea got that goal back, but you know. It was still a very comfortable night's work for Arsenal, who were very, very good for 60 minutes. And, um, you know, I wasn't sure what to expect after what had gone on in the last few games. Obviously, the City match last time out was such a horrible night, tough night, difficult one to get over. I wasn't sure what sort of Arsenal to expect when I got to the Emirates yesterday. I was happy that Mikel made the changes that he did. I said that in yesterday's player ratings video that I recorded. If you haven't watched that, it's up from last night. Um, you know, I wanted to see Kivior come in. I didn't understand, and I said that in a video earlier in the week. I didn't get why, just because he's left-footed, that means he can't play alongside Gabriel. You know, you spend that sort of money on a defender in January. You clearly think he's a very talented player. That surely you play him if the fact is if you're playing a you're having to play Rob Holding, who was clearly impacting the team in a negative fashion, playing. You know, you you surely just turn to Kivior and give him a chance. Just because he's left-footed, that shouldn't mean that he can't play it. And so I was really happy to see him play. I thought he played really, really well, made a big difference, was calm, composed, read the game well, was aggressive when he needed to be. I thought it was a good performance from Kivior. Um, so I was happy to see that change. I was happy that Jorginho started ahead of party. I don't think party should have started, given his last few performances. And I thought Jorginho played well, controlled the game, especially in the first half. And I wanted to see Trossard start, and he did as well. And I thought Trossard played well, and I thought he was unlucky to get taken off after about 60 minutes, to be honest. And Arsenal weren't as good once Trossard went off the pitch. I just think he brings real control to that team. Um, so yeah, I was happy with those changes, and I thought it was a good performance from Arsenal. And Martin Odegaard was absolutely at the heart of it all. And I was really happy for Martin Odegaard because I thought he was unfairly criticised after the Man City game. A lot of people piled on him, as is the way in football, but a lot of high-profile people piled on it, piled on him. And, you know, the Sky, I thought Carragher, uh, Neville, you know, this big high-profile people sort of questioned not just his performance, but his leadership qualities. And I thought that was really harsh because Martin Odegaard's been fantastic for Arsenal this season. And I think it's really, I'm not sure you can really question his leadership um, abilities because he's led from the front all get all season he's pressed he's harried he's performed he's scored he's set up goals yes he's not a strike uh, captain who shouts and screams but I think he has led this Arsenal team very well this season he scored big goals in big games and he's led from the front and he did that again last night it was fabulous Martin Odegaard Chelsea just couldn't deal with him his two goals were great his first finish was fantastic his second goal was good as well um and I just, yeah, I just thought it was a really good response to some really unfair criticism that was coming his way. I saw some quotes from Mark Schwarzer, um, who was doing some work for BBC, and he's like, when Odegaard first came to the club, he saw signs of what a quality player he could be. But at that point, he wasn't scoring enough goals to impact the game in the final third. He has really added that to his game. He's making runs into the box late, and he's arriving in those positions. His finishing has improved. That is partly down to confidence because of how well the season's gone for him, but he looks a totally different player, and at 30 million, an absolute bargain. And he is an absolute bargain. There can be few better pieces of transfer business done, not just by Arsenal, but by Premier League clubs in a long, long time than Martin Odegaard from Real Madrid for just 30 million. It's a wonderful piece of business. He's an absolute bargain. Um... And, you know, he's 22 goal contributions for Martin Odegaard this season. Now, he scored 14 goals in the Premier League. He's got eight assists as well. 
that's a fantastic return for a player who, as Schwartz has said there, people sort of questioned is whether he scored enough goals. For a player who was had those questions sort of hanging over him at the start of the season, to do what he's done, I think, has been really, really impressive. It's been a real emphatic response to the questions that were being asked of him. I spoke to Mikel after the game yesterday about Odegaard, and I said, look, do you think the criticism that has come his way following the City game has been pretty unfair given what he's produced for this team this season he said look I don't know because I don't read the comments what I can say is that he I think he's been exceptional for us you look at his contribution every single day uh, day in the team and then what he does out there every single time it's exceptional the perfect player that plays perfect football every time does not exist but what Martin has done this season deserves a lot of credit um, and I asked him about the goals and assist tally. He said, that's what we had to get out of him. He's got the talent, but he needs to occupy different spaces and become a threat and have that mentality to win matches, not just to control games. I think that's what's changed. And when you have someone who is as humble as him and has every single day to push and learn and train, these things happen. And I think he'll be rewarded for his work. He's still just 24. I think that's the thing with Odegaard. He is only going to get better. People sort of, after that City game, they compared him to... Um, De Bruyne, who's obviously fantastic for City. But what you've got to remember, when you're comparing Odegaard to De Bruyne, De Bruyne is like in his 30s now. He's been there in the Premier League for years and years. He's at the very top of his game. He knows absolutely everything there is to know about football. Martin Odegaard's still learning. Yes, he feels like he's been around forever, because he has, because he broke through so young. But he's still learning. He's 24. He's not even near his peak yet. And to do this, what he's doing this season, to get the numbers that he's getting this season, 14 goals and 8 assists, I think he deserves a lot of credit and I think it's really unfair some of the criticism that come his way and I thought it was brilliant yesterday. He set the tone when Arsenal needed it after such a tricky period of games when they needed their captain to step up. He stepped up and he delivered yesterday just at the time that his team needed him and I think he deserves an awful lot of, uh, a lot of credit for that. Um, you know, for Arteta it was a big night. I thought for Arsenal it was a big night but for Arteta it was. He also had question marks over him going into the game. Could he motivate his players? Could he get them to perform, you know, bounce back after that City defeat and he certainly did the way they started the game as I said they were helped by Chelsea who are shambles I don't know what Frank Lampard was doing I really don't I don't understand the Aubameyang decision was so bizarre it honestly felt and not just that it felt like I'm pretty sure that it was the only reason he started Aubameyang yesterday was because of the whole narrative of it was Arsenal and he was hoping that maybe Aubameyang would have that sort of haunt return to haunt his former club type night now, I don't think based on analytics, stats, evidence, there's any reason for Aubameyang to start that game. It was his first start since the defeat against Arsenal in November at Stamford Bridge. He's done nothing to warrant a start. And it just felt such a desperate move from Lampard, like a manager totally out of his depth who has no idea how to turn things around at Chelsea. And, you know, I almost felt bad for Aubameyang. I mean, he had nine, he had nine touches. He only had eight in the game in Stamford Bridge. He had nine last night and four of them were kickoffs <laughs> before he was taken off at half-time. You know, and I almost felt bad for him because he was just... It was on an absolute hiding for nothing. He was thrown in by his manager in a really difficult game. And it was no surprise that he struggled and he was taken off at half-time and just reeked of a manager who has no idea what he's doing. Um and they looked at shambles, but you know Arsenal. They played very, very well. They they made sure that they didn't give Chelsea a chance or a sniff of a sort of getting a foothold in the game. They were really intense from the start. They got the goals they deserved, and it was really, really impressive. Arteta said, um, "I'm really pleased with the first 60 minutes. The way we approached the game, the way we started our energy. There was a lot of movement. We played forward, scored some great goals, and really connected with our supporters and created the atmosphere we wanted." After 60 minutes, we should have scored four or five. We didn't do that. And after conceding the goal, there is a lot. There is still a long period to play and we should have managed the game a little better. And they should have managed the game a little better. But I can understand why they're a little bit nervy after that goal went in, given the run they've been on, given the West Ham and Liverpool games when they conceded goals and threw away a lead. I'm not surprised they were a little bit nervy. The crowd got a little bit nervy as well. And I think that all creeped into the play. But aside from Mudrick, when he came on, who I thought looked dangerous when he got on the ball, who, I, again, I feel sorry for Madrid, got booed last night. It's not his fault, you know. If he had a choice, he'd be at Arsenal. <laughs> but he's not, he's at Chelsea. And I, I feel sorry for him in a way. I mean, look, the money's going to help, obviously. Shouldn't feel too sorry for him. But, you know, if he had a choice, he wouldn't be at Chelsea right now. And um, he would certainly be at Arsenal. So I'm not sure he really deserved the boos yesterday. Um, but apart from him, when he came on and when he ran at Ben White, I didn't think Chelsea really looked like a threat and Arsenal saw it out relatively comfortably. Kivior, I thought, was good. Um, like I said, 
I was happy that he started. I wanted to see him start, and I thought he played really, really well. Uh, he read the game well. He was, you know, he was composed. I liked the way he was aggressive when he needed to be. You saw he was a player who was thinking about his game. You know, when to make an inter- interception, when to sort of drop back. You know, he would have been under a lot of scrutiny. He would have knew, known he was going to be under a lot of scrutiny coming into that game. So he was under a bit of pressure. I thought he coped with that really, really well. And, you know, he's a certainty, you'd think, to start. I mean, we'll have to wait and see what happens with Gabriel and his injury. Um, but, you know, Kivy or whatever happens, I think it's a certainty to start in Newcastle now, which will be a lot lot tougher afternoon for him. So it'll be interesting to see how he copes with that. Um, Mikel said he looked, was asked, why did you throw him in now after waiting so long? He said, look, he looked ready, he looked fresh, he looked really determined. He's been getting better and better every single day, not only in training, but his interaction and his language. He's more settled and he's a player I really like. That's why I signed him. He has a potential at his age to be great. He had a big task against the players he had to face and I don't, and I think he didn't, um, he did it really well. On the Gabriel injury, I was surprised he didn't take Gabriel off earlier. Gabriel was clearly struggling. He obviously wanted to stay on. But he went down like four or five times and you know, Arsenal were comfortably winning that game. He just sort of take him off. Don't don't carry on playing him, especially when you haven't got Saliba, but he kept him on. He eventually brought him off. Holding came on. Um we asked about it in the press conference. He said he wasn't comfortable. We tried for ten or fifteen minutes, but he could not carry on, which was strange for Gabby. So we are a bit concerned about that because normally he's not the one that wants to leave the pitch. I watched him at the end of the game, he came onto the pitch, he was with you know, he was talking to Mudrick actually. Mudrick was in Zinchenko and Gabriel went up and he was doing the old hand in front of the mouth trick so you couldn't see what he was saying but he was talking and laughing with Mudrick and I was like I wonder what he is saying there um, but he was limping even then which was a concern you know Newcastle's only a few days away now and that's going to be a real physical test up at Newcastle they're going to play very long they're going to be very direct you can have Joe Linton up there you know putting pressure on the centre backs from out wide you're going to have Callum Wilson or Isaac up front whoever Eddie Howe goes with you know what Newcastle are going to do Kieran Trippier is going to swing in ball after ball into the central areas um you know Dan Byrne on the left side will be in there a giant of a player so you just know what Newcastle are going to do they did it in that game at the end of last season when they bullied Arsenal and comfortably beat them at St James's Park and it's going to be a really similar afternoon for Arsenal and if Gabriel's not there that's a big issue for me uh, in terms of his ability in the air and his physicality and you know, fingers crossed he can be fit but we'll have to wait and see on that it certainly didn't sound too promising what Mikel was saying afterwards and I didn't think Gabriel looked great after the game when he was on the pitch and he was limping pretty heavily but fingers crossed they can sort of patch him up and get him through for that one um, there was obviously a lot of talk in the press conference about whether the title race is over and look you know, Arsenal did what they had to do last night. They needed to get the win. They needed to put pressure back on Manchester City. They did that. They needed to let Manchester City know that it's not just going to be a cakewalk now through to the end of the season to win the title and that Arsenal are going to get back. If they'd have lost last night or drawn last night, that you know that would have been absolutely it, nail in the coffin time. Um, but they didn't. They're back on the top of the Premier League for now. They've at least given Manchester City something to think about. I don't think they're going to have to think about too much tonight because I think they're going to comfortably beat West Ham. And... Um, and go back to the top of the Premier League. But, you know, there's still some tricky games to come up for City. They've still got to go to Brentford. They've still got to go to Brighton. They're not going to be easy. And, um, you know, Arsenal just got to keep doing what they can do. Put the pressure on, win games, and then just hope, fingers crossed, that City might slip up somewhere. Um, and that's what they did. And Mikel was said, look, do you still have the belief that the title race is on, that there's still a chance? And he said, for sure, we discussed that. We are at the top right now with four games to go. We have to prepare for Newcastle and let's see what's happened. What we can control is to win our matches. And to do that, we have to perform as well as possible. Win- winning gives us a reset. Playing the way we play, given the team that we are and to win the game, obviously that gives you confidence, comfort and makes it better for you tomorrow when you start to prepare for Newcastle. And the mood is going to be better at Colney today that's clear you know winning helps it makes everyone happy it sends everyone into work in a good mood the following morning and that's what it's going to be like at London Colney today had it been another defeat had they not managed to win a game again and made it five games in a row without a win you know, it would have just been such a depressing time we were, I was talking about that with a few journalists who were leaving the stadium last night just the importance of getting back on track and just easing the pressure a little bit sort of taking the narrative away from the fact that Arsenal have gone all these games without a win that was so important last night and now we just wait and see what happens with Manchester City later on tonight against West Ham 
yeah, fingers crossed. Can West Ham do something? I doubt it. I don't think so. But you never know. Stranger things have happened in football. We shall see. Anyway, anything you've seen, agreed with, disagreed with, let me know in the video, in the comments below. If you want to see my player ratings from last night, uh, then head back to the video I uh, posted up from the Emirates press box after last night's game. Thanks for watching, everyone. Have a very good day. I'll speak to you soon.